Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm so grateful to, to the section, grateful to um, Beth Wittenberry, who is the current chair and the newly minted section chair, Juan Thomas. Um, I want to thank Paula Shapiro and the team who got me here. <laughs> and I want to thank my mentor and idol, Elaine Jones, the one and only, for that wonderful introduction. So this year I received the Thurgood Marshall Lifetime Achievement Award from LDF. Thanks to William Hubbard, I gave the inaugural uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg keynote at the World Justice Forum at The Hague. Early, early next year, I'll receive the Brandeis Award from the University of Louisville, and tonight I'm re receiving this wonderful award from all of you. And I say that because I really am just a little girl from Queens, the youngest of 10 children who dreamed of doing this work, and um, it has gone past my wildest imagination of um, what I hoped when I was a girl and wanted to be a civil rights lawyer it could be. Uh, and every moment like this, it goes so fast and you're working so hard, there are very few pause moments. Um, and so I want you to know how much I appreciate this pause moment. Um, my daughter who's here, Amali, uh, knows that um, you know I kind of keep it movement moving I don't I don't stop and smell the flowers a lot uh, unless I'm forced to do so and um, so I thank you for forcing me to stop and, and smell the flowers um, I'm proud of what we accomplished at LDF over the last nine years uh, I had no idea even though I thought I did what I was signing up for Six months after I became director counsel, the Supreme Court decided the Shelby County case. Uh, I think it was the following summer, um, we all saw Eric Garner say, I can't breathe 11 times. That fall, Ferguson exploded. The next year, we saw Walter Scott running in that park in North Charleston, shot by police officers. Um, and then, of course, in 2016, we had the election of Donald Trump. Um, so whatever I thought, and I knew the job was challenging. <laughs> That's not what I was thinking it was going to be. I wanted to do the job um, because I believed, like Elaine said, I, I have no false modesty about it. I believed I was the right person for that time. And uh, it mattered to me that Elaine believed I was the right person because she does not suffer fools, as you know. Uh, and because I know she takes LDF's legacy as seriously as I do um, and would not mess around um, if she didn't think that I was the right person for the position. And so I'm very, very grateful to her let me reassure you, Elaine, that you are absolutely correct in why I left LDF in 1993. In fact, uh, you're right. I um, joined LDF in 1988. I did my first trial when I was six months pregnant. I weaned my daughter to do my first Fifth Circuit argument. Um, it was a lot. And uh, I didn't even realize how much it was. By the time my daughter was three, um, and it wasn't this daughter, it's the oldest daughter. Uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, some days I wouldn't see her and, you know, I'd work late at the office. And I remember there was one night, I might have been working on the Supreme Court brief in the Houston lawyer's case, and I was in the office until about four or five in the morning. I came home, slept for two hours, woke up, tried to get my daughter ready for school. And um, my husband was gonna drive her to her preschool. And she said, what are you gonna do now, mommy? And I said, I think I'm gonna, you know, try to get a little bit of sleep. And she said, you sleep all the time? You're sleeping again? <laughs> and I realized she didn't know that, you know, I hadn't come in till two hours before. And I thought, you know, she doesn't even know what I do. Like, I'm so out there. Um, but the other reason that I left Elaine is the reason many people um, who leave LDF choose to do so. It's such a rich experience. You learn so much about law, about justice, about race, about inequality, 
about the voice of your clients, and it's hard to find a place to put what you're learning. You're working, you're litigating, you have cases, and, and you sense sometimes that you're onto something big, but you don't really have the space to work it out. So I wanted to write. Uh, and truthfully, my scholarship for 10 years was all based on the litigation I had done at LDF. It all came out of the lessons of that litigation. Um, and so the timing was just what it was, <laughs> Elaine, but um, I still considered LDF my professional home. I, I worked at LDF for five years and then I taught at University of Maryland Law School for 20 years and I still regarded LDF as my professional home. That's how deep it gets in your marrow. And so coming back felt like the right thing. So um, I do want to say on this occasion a few words about the moment in which we find ourselves in this country and what it means actually to be uh, a lawyer committed to civil rights and social justice at this moment. And I want to, of course, um, talk about and acknowledge the extraordinary person for whom this award is named, Thurgood Marshall. First, I want to um, say, because I think it's important to say it out loud, that we are in a moment of grave democratic crisis. Not saying it doesn't change the truth. We are in a moment of grave democratic crisis. The trick about it, about this moment, is that whatever happens, we may all meet in this same room next year. Our lives may be okay. We may still have a place to live. We may still have our cars. We may still have a practice. We may have even more of a practice. Um, we'll still eat dinner and drink coffee and wine. Um, but if we don't take this very seriously, we will not be doing all of those things in a democracy. And ultimately, and ultimately, as a profession, we have to decide whether that matters to us. What I learned, to be honest, over the last five or six years is that there are whole swaths of our profession that appear to be agnostic about whether or not we are a democracy. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> there are members of our profession, many of them, prominently placed, who are agnostic about whether or not we are a democracy. They will tell you they love their country. But whether or not we are a democracy for them is optional. It's probably the only thing that has shocked me <laughs> over the last five or six years. So it's important for those of us who believe in democracy to be honest about the nature of the crisis that we are in so that we can understand what we have to do. The reason I think it's important to describe it as a crisis because when you're in a crisis, you do things differently than you do them in normal times, right? Um, if you're in a crisis in your family, if you have a health crisis, if you have um, a crisis in the infrastructure of your home, your roof's falling in. When you face a crisis, you behave as though you're in a crisis. And that means that you do things differently than you normally would. And I think this is the challenge at this moment for all of us writ large, but certainly for those of us in this profession, and certainly for those of us in this American Bar Association. Are we behaving as though we are in a democratic crisis? Are we behaving with the kind of urgency that you do when you are in a crisis? Are we expending the capital that has been built up by this organization at this crisis moment? I know it's hard to think about, um, I, I take institutions and organizations very, very seriously. I understand what it takes to be the steward of an organization of importance, as I was at LDF. I mean, 
you know, the first thing was do no harm, right? But as we moved further in to 2016 and 2017, um, I found it necessary to expend some capital to do some things that maybe you all saw it as being on the edge a little bit for LDF, but I had determined that we were in a crisis. And I also took my um, marching orders from every director council who came before me beginning with Thurgood. Thurgood was one of one. Justice Marshall was one of one. And his leadership at LDF really inspired me to understand the kind of um, courage I needed to bring to leading the organization to expand it beyond what had been its limits. Marshall had no fear of showing up and being present wherever there was the need. That's why Fred Gray knew he could call just then Thurgood Marshall after Rosa Parks was arrested and say, I need your help. That's why members of the military who were being court-martialed at alarming rates in Korea had their mothers write to Thurgood Marshall, who tangled with General MacArthur and got permission to go out to Korea and interview these black service members who were being wrongfully court-martialed and intervened on their behalf. It's why Thurgood Marshall went out to the West Coast to deal with the Port Chicago mutiny trials when black soldiers who saw unsafe conditions, black sailors who saw unsafe conditions refused to work and were accused of mutiny. And he went out to do the investigation and concluded it was not mutiny, it was racism. He understood that in addition to your docket of cases, you have to show up in the moments that are going to define the civil rights questions of the day. And that is how we ended up creating a policing reform project in 2014. We understood that a seismic shift was happening. And that's what I think has to happen in the ABA. I believed, I believed that LDF was strong enough, that our reputation was sound enough, that our record was beyond reproach. And that I could step out a little bit at first from the confines of the way I think people traditionally saw the organization to speak in ways that were more direct, um, to bring cases that caused some to hesitate, and I want you to know that it was not easy for me either. We worried about everything that we did. It's not easy to sue the President of the United States. In the history of LDF prior to 2016, I think we had sued uh, entities of the federal government twice, maybe? Adams and, and uh, the Mary Frances Berry, um, Civil Rights Commission twice. Within two years, we had sued between 2016 and 2018, seven cabinet members, the president, the, the attorney general. Um, it, it wasn't easy. We didn't know, particularly when it was, became, became clear that there was um, a sense of retaliation that we might be exposing ourselves to. We weren't sure when we would get the audit from hell. It wasn't easy in December of 2020, after we saw what was happening after the election, to sue the President of the United States under the KKK Act, but we did. And we did it because we felt this is 
what we were made for. We did it because we felt that the mere fact that we were doing it would convey an urgency. And we did it because we were going to bring to it all the signature features of LDF, meticulous research, excellent lawyering, collaboration with law firms and other leaders in the profession. We were going to kick every tire to make sure that our claims were sound. And we were going to conduct ourselves in the way we always do, with respect for the system that we have pledged an oath to, and with a sense of decorum as we do the work. And so we were able to step out and do these things. I still remember the Saturday morning I woke up and I called our litigation director and said, I think we have to sue the United States Postal Service. Now, I love the United States Postal Service. <laughs> they had just issued the Gwen Eiffel stamp in January, and I was there. It was extraordinary. Um, but when we saw that ballots were not being delivered and that there were issues in 2020 regarding the mail and absentee ballots, we determined that we would have to sue the United States Postal Service. And we did. And we worked getting ballots delivered. Many people don't know this, but LDF still litigation director Sam Spital was in hearings nine, 10 hours a day into the evening in Judge Emmett Sullivan's court, all throughout those first two weeks of November, making sure that ballots got delivered in places where they could still be counted. And then did it again. And then did it again in January for the special election in Georgia. And now we have an ongoing injunction that still covers the United States Postal Service for the next eight years so that for elections, we can continue to make sure that absentee ballots get prioritized in the mail system. <laughs> Elaine Jones began um, LDF's deep engagement around the issue of judicial appointments. And um, I have tried to borrow from each director council. And from Elaine, I borrowed the deep engagement in Washington, D.C., with both legislation and with the appointment of judicial nominees. And I know that the ABA plays obviously a powerful role in that as well. Um, and we continued to play that role, and that wasn't easy for us either. We, we litigate in all of these courts. We litigate in the United States Supreme Court. It's not easy to be on prime time, you know, talking about a nominee. But when you all don't speak out, let me back up and, and, and say this first, <laughs> and then come back around to the hard part of it. One of the things that was so remarkable about Thurgood Marshall is that he was a trial lawyer. I mean, I'll say that again. He was a trial lawyer. Uh, and I've always kept that in my head. It matters to me. He genuinely believed in the rule of law and the power of law to address injustice and discrimination. And I am the same. I'm a true believer still. I'm also a true believer in litigation. I taught civil procedure for 20 years because I love it. I loved civil procedure in law school. That's how weird I am. <laughs> because I believe that litigation has a power for the people that I represent. It allows them to speak. If you can get yourself to trial, in a courtroom in which everyone has to stay still and listen to them. And what I experienced at LDF, my first tour of duty, the first time I felt that, the ordinary people that I represented who drove all the way out to Waco, Texas to come to court, who lamented their inability to 
participate and elect candidates that they wanted to serve on the judiciary. And when they got on the stand, they spoke, and sometimes for the first time, all of these powerful people from the AG's office, from their county, from the courts, were silent and had to listen to them. They brought these stories, their narratives, their truth into court. And it was our job as skilled litigators to help the court listen to that testimony, receive the evidence that we developed, listen to the experts, Wendy Green, who's here and, and was, was an expert witness for us just a couple years ago and still is in a case challenging natural hair discrimination. So often we're taking something that a judge has never heard of before, that they know nothing about, and our clients get to tell their story, and we bring them people that they never heard of. They didn't know there was an expert on natural hair. <laughs> and with our skillful lawyering, those stories go through the crucible of litigation, and when they come out the other end, if we are successful, they are truth, they're findings of fact. A judge has determined that what she said isn't just what she said, it is the truth. And the people we represent have been fighting for that, for their truth to be recognized. So I've believed in litigation, that if they can get heard, I've said it all the time, if we get to trial, I like our chances. Doesn't matter who the judge is. We win before conservative trial court judges all the time. But you know what does matter? Is having a judge that knows something about litigation. So back again to the process of judicial nominees. <laughs> it's not just ideology. I'm not suggesting that's not important. It is important. But when you don't speak out about a judge who's never litigated a case, has no experience, and my attorneys have to go before the, my erstwhile attorneys, I keep forgetting I'm no longer in that position, but LDF's attorneys and others from other civil rights organizations, and maybe some of you, have to appear before these judges who don't know what they're doing it interrupts the ability of our clients to be heard, to be heard. Now, why is this important? I, we win cases, we also lose cases, as you know. What has always amazed me since my first, okay, I won my first case, so I can't say my first case. The first, um, <laughs> the first case I lost is that my clients always had a different lens. I mean, I'm so competitive, I must win. And when I don't, I'm just beside myself. And my clients would always say, no, 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 I'll never forget the day that Miss Jones was on the stand and everybody had to listen to her. I'll never forget the look on the face when you cross-examine this person. They, they pulled out of it different things than I was thinking about. The process for them, so long as they felt heard, mattered. So when we talk about respect for the courts and respect for the legitimacy of the courts and judges and the system, it is that ability to be heard. Now let me tell you why that's extra important in this moment. Because increasingly we are not part of the ongoing debates and conversations about things that are happening in our profession that are not directly about civil rights and social justice. Take, for example, the shadow docket on the Supreme Court, the emergency docket, if you will. One of the reasons I was willing to join the uh, President Biden's commission on the Supreme Court was because I wanted to bring the perspective, first of all, of a real litigator and of our clients into these conversations. And far too often we absent ourselves from the rooms where those kinds of conversations are happening. But when you litigate a case for two weeks during a pandemic, 
in order to allow black voters and disabled voters in Alabama to vote absentee. And you win that case, and you get a 192-page opinion from the trial court judge in joining Alabama and compelling them to allow more relaxed absentee voting procedures to happen so that black and disabled voters will not have to do all the things that Alabama then required you to do to absentee vote, which is have your, your vote, your ballot notarized and to have um, your photo attached to the ballot and so on and so forth. And the Secretary of State said, well, you know, they should just go to a Kinko's. This is at the height of COVID when it was ravaging our communities and find a notary or two witnesses when we were all telling our parents and grandparents, don't let anybody in. So we win that case, 192 page opinion, and the judge quotes liberally from the testimony of our witnesses, our witnesses who said, my, my parents and my grandparents had to risk their lives to vote. We shouldn't have to do that today. And that case then disappears because after it's upheld in the 11th Circuit, the state likes its chances with the Supreme Court and puts it on the emergency docket. And the court stays the judgment of the district court. And then you have to tell your client that not only does that mean that things are back the way they were because we could never litigate in time for the election that's just coming in two months. We could never get it all the way back up through the system. But also it means that that 192 page opinion, poof, it's disappeared. These are harder things to explain to your clients and have them still believe in the justice system. So when you hear conversations about the shadow docket, it's not some arcane thing for Supreme Court litigators. It's about a process increasingly used in ways that affect the rights of millions of ordinary people, prisoners at risk of COVID, voters. We know that this is true. Women in Texas, that period until Dobbs was ultimately decided was, should have been one of the most horrifying and frightening periods for our profession. When the Supreme Court allowed a state to go forward with a plan that would allow essentially bounty hunters to be created to interfere with what the court had said was a fundamental right in 1973. Roe had not been overturned, and yet the court allowed Texas to continue. Our voices were needed then. Your voice was needed then, robustly, to talk about that process not just the outcome you wanted, but that the process undermined the integrity of the legal system. This is the moment for expending the capital. I was saying to Beth at the table, we will either speak now publicly with our voices and be heard, or our country will be so transformed that we will only be able to whisper in our homes about these things. And if you believe it can't happen here, think about all of the elements. Voter suppression. The willingness now not only to just suppress votes but to overturn elections. Intimidation of election officials. That it's happening unabated. We still don't have legislation that would protect election workers from threats. Police violence. Maybe it's gone out of everyone's head since millions of people took to the street after George Floyd was killed. But if we saw what we see here in this country in videos that at least I see every day, in any other country with armed officers of the state killing innocent and unarmed people with impunity, we would know what it was. We would know what it was. Hypersegregation the takeover of history and memory by states that have decided that the truth does not serve their purposes. These are all the hallmarks 
of rising fascism and authoritarianism. And lying to ourselves will not make it go away. So my charge is for you to step out. Do what, what Thurgood did. Go to Korea, tangle with General MacArthur if you have to. To do what we had the courage to do. Um, it's not easy. The personal threats are real. We've all had to change our lives in ways you can't imagine. I don't talk about it publicly because it's nothing to compare to the danger that Thurgood faced in his day. It's just part of what we have to deal with. But just know that. Know that when we are all appropriately concerned when we fear that judges may face violence as Judge Salas did several years ago in New Jersey, just know that those of us who do this work have also been living with the reality of threats and have had to accommodate our lives in order to speak. And so I feel quite comfortable requiring you to do so as well. I'm grateful to you tonight for this award. I'm incredibly proud to be part of the team of civil rights lawyers who I think do the noblest work in this country as lawyers. I love being part of this profession, but it's our profession. And if we don't protect it, if we don't use it for the purposes of justice and equality, if we don't make our voices heard on Capitol Hill, in state bars, in our own communities, in the places where they're debating issues like stare decisis, we will have deserved ourselves in this profession. It's no accident that the dissenting justices in Dobbs quoted from the final dissent of Thurgood Marshall in Payne versus Tennessee, in which Marshall lamented the court's decision to step away from an abandoned stare decisis in a case um, involving criminal law. And Marshall opened his dissent with the line, power, not reason, is the currency of this new court's decision making. Power, he said, not reason is the currency of this new court's decision making. And that is the line that Justices Breyer and Kagan and Sotomayor quoted to describe the majority opinion in Dobbs. We're in a crisis moment and I hope that you all will feel inspired, encouraged, and convicted to behave as though we are in a crisis moment and that you will use your voice in this important organization to ensure that we uphold the oaths that every one of us took when we became lawyers. Democracies unravel when the rule of law unravels. There is no place that is a democracy that doesn't uphold the rule of law. So we're an essential part of the future of this country. I take it very seriously. I will be writing about it and thinking about the next ways that I want to do this work. I'm not stepping away from the fight even though I'm stepping away from LDF and I know you are not either. Thank you so much for this honor. <laughs>